to be here. Uh, typically, we academics present in academic conferences. So it's really wonderful to venture out a little bit into the policy world and um, be here. I'm very thankful to have been invited to this panel. Um, so um, it's it's a little, um, I, I want to maintain eye contact, but I will be referring to um, the screen uh, for a slide. So if it's a little awkward, I'm, my apologies for that. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, constitutional choice uh, or the adoption of the um, uh, 2004 Afghan constitution. Um, and, and so um, uh, the uh, before uh, going into um, details, I do want to provide some background on um, uh, the paper itself. Um, so in 2001, um, uh, the Taliban regime was ousted through a military um, uh, operation um, by the U.S. and coalition forces. Um, and uh, in the meantime, there was a uh, talk in um, uh, hosted by the U.N. Um, in, in Bonn, uh, became known as the 2001 Bonn Accords, where um, different Afghan groups met um, to uh, discuss a uh, post-transition power sharing arrangement. Um, uh, uh, during this um, during these talks, um, uh, an interim government was selected, um, headed by um, Hamid Karzai, um, and um, the um, interim government was, uh, or the interim administration or authority, um, um, used interchangeably, um, was tasked with um, holding, uh, organizing a process for um, constitutional selection uh, to, to write and adopt a constitution. Um, so um, during, so I, I will go over the phases, the three phases of constitutional selection itself, but um, just quickly, um, and this is a pointer, um, probably not. Um, uh, the uh, one of the there, there are so many contentious issues throughout the um, constitutional selection process, but one of the contentious issues was um, the choice of political system. Were they going to end up with a presidential system, the parliamentary, a semi-presidential system? So this this proved to be a very contentious um, issue. Um, uh, and um, the constitution eventually um, uh, the the adopted constitution determined that it was uh, adopted. The, presidential system, a very centralized presidential system for Afghanistan. Um, and this is um, somewhat puzzling because the um, literature on um, uh, institutional design, um, which draws very heavily from the experience of third uh, wave democracies or emerging democracies, um, really um, uh, warns um, against uh, uh, sort of about pearls of uh, presidentialism. Um, so why did the um, Afghan uh, political elite um, choose a, a very centralized presidentialism for Afghanistan? Um, so um, the research questions are um, sort of straightforward. I'm asking that the U.S. impose a centralized presidential um, presidentialism on Afghanistan, or was it more of a, uh, a, a or was it chosen by rational, self-interested domestic um, elites concerned with political survival? So. Um, there are two uh, sort of two different answers for um, this question, or two um, uh, different literatures to tap in here um, uh, to really um, give an answer, or try to ex explain um, constitutional uh, choice in um, Afghanistan. The first one I refer to is institutional design literature. This actually goes way back to what um, Woodrow Wilson wrote in a letter in, in an essay. Um, uh, basically in, in 19th century, basically praising the British style parliamentary system um, compared to a presidential system in the US. Um, however, the third wave of democratization, which occurred mainly in Africa and Latin America, and also after the um, a collapse of the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, this uh, literature became known as sort of new institutionalism, um, uh, this literature emphasizes the causal effects of institutions on political outcomes. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, the, the argument there is um, uh, to design the institutions um, in a specific way, and then they will then affect 
a political stability, um, whether that democracy survives or not, or whether um, uh, the political system will be um, consolidated. Um, so, um, so, so democratic consolidation is uh, perceived as a function of political system. Um, and so the argument here is if you choose a presidential system, uh, chances are um, very high that this will, uh, that the, the system will collapse. Um, this literature, um, uh, with, with some notable exceptions, uh, draws heavily on the experience of emerging democracies, third world democracies. There is, however, um, uh, there, there's so many uh, uh, throughout, uh, they've been criticized on, on multiple grounds. Um, uh, uh, so, so first set of critiques um, uh, emphasized contextual and, and cultural factors um, in determining the outcomes of democratic consolidation or democratic transitions, whether they will. Um, so Lipset, for example, argued that um, countries who did not reach a certain level of um, economic growth or economic development or certain level of GDP uh, per capita, they um, are more likely to collapse um, than um, uh, countries that had um, uh, surpassed that threshold. Uh, Putnam um, uh, made more of a cultural argument and um, contended that um, certain cultures may be more um, prone to um, democracy and so democracy will survive in those cultures. Um, so these were some earlier critiques of the um, institutional design literature or um, uh, new institutionalism. Um, recently, um, there, there has been um, sort of a, a new class of scholars um, looking at um, uh, critiquing the new institutionalism on theoretical grounds. So um, um, LG, for example, um, has argued that uh, we really need to explain um, uh, institutional choice first, uh, which theoretically precedes uh, the institutions themselves. Um, so what goes on before, in other words, um, uh, or the structural factors before institutions are designed may be more important theoretically um, to explore. Um, uh, and so um, uh, Boyce uh, wrote a, a, a very um, influential uh, article um, in 1999, um, and he um, there um, uh, argued that um, the ruling parties uh, in developed worlds chose um, electoral rules um, that, that would maximize their um, representation. So it was a very deliberate choice of institutional design. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, Brzozowska um, in 2004 actually wrote a, 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 a pushed this argument further and um, argued that electoral reform in Belgium and Bulgaria um, reflect, reflected tactical seat loss. Um, so um, even that the ruling party was more concerned about um, uh, extra institutional threat to their survival. So they chose um, uh, electoral, inst so electoral institutions um, uh, reflected the choice of electoral institutions reflected those concerns um, about threats from uh, extra institutional threats. Um, so um, the um, institutional um, uh, origins literature is the other um, sort of literature um, or group of scholars uh, or scholars of uh, articles um, that tries to also um, answer the question of institutional selection or explore institutional selection. Um, this um, in, in this literature, the emphasis is more on what goes on before institutions are chosen. Um, so um, uh, it's a very rational choice, a game theoretic, for the most part, the literature, um, and emphasizes this so the, the intentional design of um, institutions by rational individuals. Um, and so they, they, they're motivated by uh, perceive, uh, preserving their um, status and maximizing their gains. Um, the problem here is um, this literature very heavily draws on the experience of Western European democracies. Um, it really, they're, they're, you don't find any um, assertions there that it doesn't, so that, that their the theoretical framework does not apply to emerging democracies, but there's also no case from emerging democracies that would support uh, the assumptions of this literature. So I'm actually arguing that 2004 African Constitutional Selection supports the core assumptions of this literature. 
Um, so the, the, the one contribution there is to actually um, test those um, assumptions and hypotheses using a case from an emerging democracy. Um, so here's my um, specific ar uh, argument or parts of uh, my argument. Um, the 2004 African constitution was a product of cho the choices made by the domestic political elites. Um, uh, transitional politics enabled key domestic political actors to um, exert disproportional influence on the process of um, institutional selection. Um, so, uh, uh, namely, the 2001 um, Bonn Accords actually um, created uh, power asymmetries among um, domestic political elites that enabled some of them to actually be able to push for their preferences when it came to constitutional selection. Um, these domestic elites chose a highly centralized presidential system that would ensure their survival and preserve their political dominance and their continued access to power resources of the state. Now, opposition obviously is um, motivated by um, uh, being able to actually have future access to uh, power and resources of uh, the, um, the state, but uh, uh, the um, ruling elite, um, and I refer to um, Karzai and his cabinet um, as the ruling elite by virtue of their access to uh, political resources of the state. Um, they were able to actually push for their preference uh, because of the power asymmetry. Um, the use of support, support of presidentialism. So the U.S. did actually support presidentialism for other reasons, um, but but I argue that it may have only bolstered the bargaining position of the um, those domestic elites um, who preferred presidentialism. So um, uh, the answer to that question: Did the U.S. impose a presidential system on Afghanistan? Is most likely not, because it was more of a choice of the um, domestic elites. Um, I make some um, explicit assumptions. Um, I can't see the screen, Laura, sorry. Um, I, I, I make some explicit assumptions here that individual action is motivated by rational calculations. There's a very rational choice approach. Uh, political elites prefer uh, institutional arrangements that best serve their interests. Um, what so, Something to point out here is uh, rational choice obviously tells us about preferences of uh, uh, policy uh, policymakers or uh, political elites, uh, but it doesn't tell us about the capacity. Why why do some elites um, end up uh, achieving their preferences um, um, and others not? So then I tap into um, the co concept of capacity, right? Measuring capacity in terms of power, uh, political power in in Afghanistan, and so um, uh, and, and uh, elite capacity will then tell us the variation or explain the variation in success rate of domestic elites in achieving their goals. So um, the uh, so that their their, their preference. So, so this in in this uh, um, theoretical framework, I actually address both preference and capacity for. Uh, choosing a certain um, political um, system over um, another. Um, so, uh, so then uh, uh, by extension, actors with relatively more power will influence institutional selection disproportionately. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, the transition, uh, uh, transition to democracy in both Iraq and Afghanistan actually renewed some attention to um, institutional design. Um, and um, so that there's some scholarship. I am just citing a few here. Um, Dawesha and Dawesha um, in 2003, before the invasion of Iraq, actually wrote um, a, an article in which they argued um, that for um, Iraq to actually end up a consolidated democracy, um, it needed um, a, a very um, specific blueprint that would um, enable um, uh, Iraqi diversity to um, uh, flourish as opposed to become an obstacle to democratic consolidation. Um, and so this is before uh, Iraq's invasion in 2003. And so they argued that the trick is to get the constitution right, the political system right, the electoral institutions, um, which well, Lawson actually adds to that argument by saying, um, elites uh, respond remarkably uh, predictive uh, in, in, in remarkably predictive ways to electoral um, uh, incentives, uh, but the trick is to get the electoral institutions right. So very um, institutional design mentality. 
Um, and then just recently, Karen Reynolds um, wrote an article um, uh, trying to explain the fall of uh, um, the um, Afghan regime back to Taliban's um, rule um, in 2000, uh, 2021. Um, in which they actually uh, made, a, again, a very specific argument along the institutional design um, uh, assumptions. Um, and so they argued that the Afghan state collapsed because at a very basic level, the founders of the new state chose the wrong governing institutions, ones that were either unsuited to existing power dynamics or that were intrinsically likely to foster division rather than compromise. So. Um, I take the exact opposite direction here, and I say that I, I argue that the 2004 um, Afghan constitution actually reflected uh, the existing uh, power dynamics of the time. So, um, very um, specifically, um, the opposite. So, to, again, drawing attention to uh, what comes prior to institutional, um, prior to institutions, or drawing attention to institutional choice. Um, I use uh, process tracing, which is a qualitative method, um, and it, um, so through this method, you can actually explore the timing and sequencing of events leading up to the outcome. Um, that sounds fairly straightforward, right? Um, uh, and so uh, my data um, mainly come from interviews that I did with the leads um, who were directly involved in the institutional um, selection process. Um, I collected the um, interviews back in 2015 before I um, uh, defended my dissertation. Um, and so um, I also um, have used newspaper accounts, uh, publications that um, were made available to me by on-site research institutions. There were quite a few collecting data. And then also um, um, Dr. Barnett Rubin, who um, has been studying Afghanistan for eight years, and was directly involved as um, an, um, uh, not as a constitutional expert, but as um, an um, American scholar who um, knew Afghanistan very well. And he was very directly involved in the process of negotiations, trying to make sure that the constitution sort of followed um, a, a legal framework and, and trying to um, uh, negotiate between uh, the opposition and the ruling party. Um, he uh, passed on to me um, a, a folder filled with unpublished documents, which which was a, a, an absolute gem um, for for this paper. This wouldn't have been possible without um, those documents. So I was able to use those in in this paper. Um, so here um, is a timeline of the constitutional selection process. Um, the, the first stage. Um, this was laid out in Bonn, um, a 2001 Bonn Accord. Um, the first stage or stage one was the drafting stage or the suite. Um, the process, this process began, begins in, in November, on November 3rd, 2002, ends Mar uh, on March 31st, 2003. Um, the second stage is um, uh, or finalizing. Um, so some uh, reviewing of the uh, initial um, draft. Um, this begins April 26th uh, and um, ends in October 15th. So there is a lag period and I will explain what happens between then. Um, and then the third stage, um, the suite or the adoption stage begins on December 14th. This is when um, uh, there is a constitutional lawyer jerga um, held and um, the um, draft constitution is discussed and eventually um, adopted, although that was also not a very sort of, there was a, no formal vote on it. Um, the chair of the Constitutional Lawyer Jirga asked everyone to stand up and uh, pray for rain, for unity, so on and so forth. And then he said, we now announce the constitution adopted. Um, so there wasn't actually a formal vote um, taken on this. Um, key actors include um, the incumbent group, um, uh, which is, um, uh, consists of um, Hamid Karzai, the um, a transitional president, uh, uh, the president of the transitional authority at that time. So he's elected the president of, president of uh, or head of the transitional authority in 2002 through, through a, um, an emergency lawyer. 
Um, and then um, returning technocrats who actually occupied a lot of the cabinet seats in uh, Perzai's um, uh, transitional um, administration. Um, their preferences um, really, uh, they really preferred a, a very strong presidential system um, and a strong uh, central government. Uh, one thing that was notable here was that um, they were very united in, pers uh, in um, uh, pursuit of their uh, preferences. Um, and, and yes, their preferences did prevail. Um, the opposition consisted mainly of the former um, Mujahideen leaders. Um, uh, Yunus Kwanani was uh, also um, involved in um, bond talks in 2001, represented the United Front. Um, Rashid Dostum is the um, leader of um, Junbish party um, um, and also um, the, the leader of, uh, um, uh, sort of but by design, the leader of uh, the um, Uzbek ethnic uh, group. Uh, Wali Masood is the brother of um, uh, the legendary Ahmed Shah Masood. Um, and so, uh, and, and Mohaqiq uh, is the leader of, uh, or was the leader of the um, uh, Wahdat party um, and also um, sort of the representative of the um, Hazara ethnic party, uh, ethnic group. Sorry, um, they um, th th they were very fragmented in pursuit of their interests. Um, some of them preferred parliamentary system. Um, the uh, more uh, the, the leaders of uh, these ethnic groups that were uh, more geographically concentrated wanted a provincial, a more provincial um, uh, autonomy uh, and a, pr a, a parliamentary system. Um, and that some members, um, namely um, Yunus Kwanuni, uh, wanted a semi-presidential system. Um, and he actually, from even during the bond talks, had um, in envisioned himself as the prime minister. Um, so they are very fragmented in uh, pursuit of their preferences, and um, their preferences are not met um, eventually. And then the other key actor included representatives of the international community. Um, Lakhtar Brahimi uh, was the representative of the, um, the, the UN representative um, or, or representative of the Secretary, UN Secretary General. Um, Zalmay Khalilzad was the US representative um, in these um, negotiations. So th th their role becomes more prominent during um, the constitutional lawyer jerga. Um, they preferred um, strong central government because they were concerned, and the parliamentary system because they were concerned about potential power of um, ex Mujahideen leaders um, do basically dominating the parliament, uh, the parliament um, there. And then um, uh, they wanted fewer checks um, on executive power. Three minutes, okay. Um, executive power so that they, um, uh, so that uh, uh, decision making is not slow. Um, uh, it, and, and then, um, um, but, but they preferred election safeguards, which ended up not actually um, uh, put in place in, in the constitution. Um, I, I was told, I was just told this, I have only three minutes, so I'm going to rush through the rest of this. Um, uh, some evidence. Uh, so the first uh, stage of a constitutional um, uh, selection was constitutional drafting. Commi this, this commission is a nine-member commission, which is appointed by Karzai um, in um, October um, uh, 2002 uh, through a presidential decree. Three members are um, three members of this committee are actually active um, uh, members of the um, transitional authority. Um, they hold posts in transition, uh, uh, transitional authority. And then um, the rest of the members are chosen from law faculty and Sharia faculty. These are people who are more, uh, uh, they're knowledgeable about um, Islamic law. So um, the, um, this, it, it, this commission, um, the review, com the, uh, the drafting commission, um, used uh, a 1964 constitution as a guide. So in some cases they were just copying and pasting um, articles um, and just changing uh, the word king to president. Um, and so the CDC, um, so the, it can, the, the, the um, as I mentioned earlier, the political system, the temp political system is a contentious issue. And this, this plays out during the um, Constitutional Drafting Commission. 
And um, the CDC or the Constitutional Drafting Commission actually chooses a middle ground solution and suggests a semi-presidential system with a prime minister. Uh, Karzai and his um, uh, cabinet want a presidential system. Most of the opposition wants a parliamentary system. Um, so the CDC chooses a middle ground. Um, uh, and then uh, the draft goes to the Constitutional Review Commission. This is a much lar a larger um, uh, committee um, of 32 members. Um, they're also appointed by Karzai um, into April 2003, um, also through a presidential decree. Um, some members of the Constitutional Draft Commission are also um, on this um, uh, commission. Um, they're tasked um, to basically consult with the Afghan people. Um, I think this is a really um, important piece of information to highlight here, to, to ask for their preferences. Um, at least one person who was involved in these um, um, interviews, uh, uh, so, sorry, in, in these negotiations, um, told me that uh, the results of the um, uh, cons consultation from uh, the general public actually the, showed that they preferred a parliamentary system. I could not find any evidence of this anywhere. I'm sure somebody has the results, but uh, it, I, I could not find them. Um, but anyway, so um, they um, they make certain changes to um, the draft, and then they pass the draft constitution uh, to the National Security Council. This is where major um, uh, changes uh, are made to the draft constitution. Um, the um, Constitutional Review Commission actually kept the recommendation of a mixed system. Uh, with the president and prime minister, but that changes during the National Security Council um, negotiations. Um, so they changed the mixed system to pure presidentialism. It's um, um, envisaged in Article 12 very clearly. Um, the um, NSC revises the draft uh, by basically going over every article and deleting and rewriting certain articles, just raising concerns among international advisors. Am I out of time completely? Yes, okay. I'm so sorry. All right, that's all right then. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, we can, uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have a little time to allow for some questions and you can uh, add in, you know, any additional points you wanted to make. Um, thank you so much for Absolutely. your understanding. I really appreciate it. Sure, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. I'm so sorry to cut in on it. Um, so our, uh, we're gonna turn the, the program over to our uh, second pre uh, presentation. And this presentation is efficiency and effectiveness of commercial courts in Afghanistan and challenges to the enforcement of their judgments. So without further ado, I'm just gonna pass right over. And at the end, we'll have questions. Again, if you have any questions throughout this time, feel free to put in the Whova chat, the Zoom chat, or um, also feel free to ask in person. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me in the panel in good morning, however, uh, it's afternoon for us. Uh, so as uh, the title was presented, I will go through that uh, uh, to a short introduction of myself. I am a research fellow at the Edinburgh Law School, and at the same time, I am a core fellow. And uh, before moving to UK, uh, I was working with the Ministry of Justice of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan as a group general director in then after the administrative structure changes, I was working as Justice General Director for Kabul City. Um, at the same time, I was working as lecturer at the Law and Political Science Faculty of Kabul University. Uh, my presentation will have uh, uh, two parts. In the first part, I will discuss efficiency and effectiveness of the commercial courts in Afghanistan. In, here I will uh, present the data in the finding from my article that was published in 2018. Uh, and then um, in the second part, I will discuss the challenges to the enforcement of commercial court judgments. Uh, I will not go deep to the historical background of commercial courts, but I will discuss uh, the existence of commercial courts from 1965 after the enactment of the uh, Commercial Procedure Code. Uh, and since then, we have um, uh, a primary uh, commercial court in the provinces level, but that's only established within six provinces of Afghanistan. And at the same level, we have uh, intermediate appellate commercial courts. And uh, for the Supreme Court, there is a specialized commercial division to review the final uh, stages of commercial disputes. 
so here the finding uh, we will discuss about uh, uh, discuss the problems of the commercial course. Here at least the two data that I presented, one from uh, World Justice Project Rule of Law Index that covers civil justice that for sure will include uh, commercial disputes and commercial uh, justice for the commercial disputes too. Here you can see that Afghanistan have been um, at, at, at the bottom of the list uh, among five uh, countries and uh, at, at the bottom of the list uh, in the region, uh, but also the other data from World Bank doing business that uh, more specifically focus on the enforcing of contract and commercial course function in Afghanistan. You can see that Afghanistan is ranking uh, a very low uh, in uh, among uh, uh, 10 lowest countries uh, from 190 countries. Uh, so the finding here is very shocking that uh, considering to the time, uh, a very simple dispute over the sales of goods uh, will uh, last for uh, 1,642 days, and that will cost 29% of the claim. And the quality of judicial process was very low, five among uh, 18 uh, looking at the criteria. Uh, I will start from uh, clarifying the rule of procedure. So as I said, uh, the main rule of procedure for the function of commercial courts have been uh, uh, the uh, Commercial Procedure Court of Afghanistan since 1965. After the enactment, there was a need of the amend amendment of the uh, code in 1970 in, in a conference between uh, commercial court judges, but that wasn't amended until uh, when I was writing my article, there was only one amendment to an article that uh, amended the, the fee for commercial codes. Uh, but after publication of my article that um, sometimes I can uh, proud that uh, there were some achievements and some of the recommendations that I provided in my article was uh, provided by some amendments uh, to the code that later we will uh, uh, show some of those, those amendments. Uh, in the same time, since uh, this uh, uh, code is not sufficient and not enough for to, to respond to all the needs of the commercial disputes, then there is uh, sometimes uh, a commercial course referring to the uh, civil procedure code. However, the problem will be that's not uh, allocated for uh, commercial uh, disputes. Uh, again, the civil procedure code is also an old one from 1990s. And then the Supreme Court uh, from the previous government, they were issuing orders and guidance for the courts to cover some of those uh, parts that they couldn't find any provision in those uh, two other uh, rule of procedures. For now, uh, what I have uh, realized from some of the colleagues back in Afghanistan, there are some rule of procedures uh, that are enacted and uh, somehow distributed among uh, among those who are working within the judicial system of Afghanistan. Actually, they are from 1950s, but they are rewritten uh, um, under the name of the current government of the Taliban. <clears throat> so th the first big problem that we have identified was a workload, a very high workload and backlog of cases within commercial codes. Uh, later, we will uh, display some of the data from the findings that we had, uh, but here we can say that uh, commercial disputes have been uh, one fourth of the total of disputes that are referred to the judicial system of Afghanistan, including the, the criminal uh, 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 cases. Uh, so here, the, the main issue in the problem is that uh, commercial courts in Afghanistan has a broad jurisdiction that covers all type of disputes that has uh, one aspect of com a commercial or commerce aspect that includes banking, insolvency, uh, public-private partnership disputes where the government is a party, disputes between merchants and consumer merchants, uh, consumer business, corporations, intellectual property that also covers uh, uh, complicated in multi-volume cases, especially in winding up of corporations. Uh, there is no distinction uh, at the time when I was writing my article between small and high value cases. When I interviewed judges, they were saying they had cases that valued less than $500, even to uh, 27 to $30 million. Uh, but as I say, there was an attachment that promulgated in uh, official Gazette 1386 in uh, 2020 that provided a simple asset uh, procedure for small claims 
uh, that, that value under 100,000 uh, Afghan. Uh, again, commercial course, uh, uh, I like other uh, course, uh, they, they, they are doing some administrative uh, uh, task, but more specifically commercial course provide power of attorney and maybe security and grants. That's something that overburden their workload. So again, they also face a lack of uh, uh, personal, professional personnel, uh, according to the law on organization and jurisdiction of the judiciary from previous government that still are in, in force and sometimes current from uh, course from the current government or referring to that in their decisions. Uh, uh, one president and four uh, member judges were allocated for the primary commercial courts and one president and six members for the appellate court. What, what we have realized this allocation was not according to the workload of courts. And um, uh, you can see that the primary court would need more members than the appellate court, but here the case was vice versa. And again, the judges uh, of commercial courts were not uh, uh, professional. However, we have a specialized commercial course, but not all judges of commercial course were specialized in commercial disputes. Uh, what we got was a deficiency from the legal education system, both law and Sharia graduates who could uh, become um, judges. They, they didn't have enough courses and practices uh, uh, practical uh, trainings on commercial disputes. And then in the judicial stage too, they didn't have that much focus. Uh, so um, commercial court judges were those that might have a little bit experience in dealing with commercial disputes, but not all of them. There were uh, frequently replacement of judges. So judges from other courts, uh, like uh, with, with the criminal background or civil uh, disputes background, they came in practice within the commercial course. That was a big challenge for the, the, the course workload too. There were also temporary appointments of judges uh, that, that makes the court, uh, court, court uh, events uh, uh, more problematic because once, uh, one, once they, they were uh, back to, to their own job, then the cases that they were assigned to was remain uh, with, with other judges. All the workload in this problem were not a big uh, a big issue uh, if, if we had a good case management system for the commercial course. But for the case management, uh, the commercial course were scored one out of six. So when we got uh, a big problem for the course uh, case management was lack of time standard for the course mean events in proceedings. We, we can divide the, the proceedings in a commercial dispute uh, to, to a pre-trial and trial uh, stages. For the pre-trial stages, that was not only the, the, the commercial course, the dealing with commercial disputes, but also there were cook departments that they were pro processing uh, all uh, uh, petitions about uh, commercial disputes before the course. So when I interviewed some judges, they were saying that Hukuk even kept uh, some of our commercial disputes for one year before trial, before handing over to the courts. And then we have government cases department of the Ministry of Justice that they are processing uh, uh, public-private partnership cases where government is a party in, in commercial disputes. So again, they don't have any time frame and they, they may keep cases for longer time. For the trial period, uh, actually commercial uh, procedure court does not have any time standard for the main events of the court. Then, as we say before, they are referring to one article in the civil procedure code that says that uh, a dispute should be concluded within four months. But again, there is vagueness and we found that again, ch challenging and problematic. Some, some judges say that because of that time limitation, they were rushing to or just uh, dispose cases and the result will be uh, uh, overturning that uh, by the uh, appellate court back to them. Uh, and as you see, um, there were uh, uh, an example that from the Hirat Commercial uh, Court that a case uh, of corporation that worth $2 million last for more than four years that still was remained unsolved in under process of the court. And again, we had another problem here that there was no specific provision for the adjournment at the time when I was writing my article, but then later some amendment uh, were there in the code in uh, 
um, courts uh, were required to adjourn cases for maximum of six months, not more than that. Uh, a big other problem uh, was electronic case tracking by the parties. So parties couldn't track their cases electronically and they have to go to the court to, to, to deal with their cases and to make sure uh, in which stages they are cases. And that end up to um, expiratory bribe. And uh, that's based on some, some of the data from global cor uh, corruption barometer that says 60% of the people feels that judiciary was corrupt or extremely corrupt. The same data was uh, getting from uh, Integrity Watch, the, the, the same reasons. Uh, and another problem here for the case management was lack of rule for assigning cases to the judges. So the, the president of the court had uh, a very high discretion on assigning cases for any judges that they think are good for reviewing the case. Uh, and that end up for unequal workload between the judges of the commercial court, but also they were uh, considering personality of judges. And that was something uh, that could be vulnerable for corruption because some corrupted group might not want specific judges to deal with their cases. And another problem was lack of uh, case reporting. We didn't have an official and accurate report of all data about cases and uh, the cases that were disposed by, by, by the court. We had two a case system in operation before the collapse of regime in Afghanistan. One was Afghanistan case administration system that was uh, funded by USID, but that wasn't for the reporting of cases that only focus on physical registration of the cases within all courts, not for the commercial courts specifically. But we also had another sophisticated system that was case management system that initiated in 2009 for criminal cases and then covered commercial and civil cases in 2014. This was very sophisticated, but not um, implemented very well. Uh, when I was um, working with the Ministry of Justice, we had a hard time to uh, encourage colleagues to, to implement the system very well in commercial disputes. Uh, we, we will uh, present some of the data about that later in the second part. Um, so the result was very clear um, opportunity for expedite bribe and unpredictability for the parties. And then a uh, very worst thing was that that, that encourage a breach of contract and obligation and uh, somehow uh, deter the claimant to bring any case or any claim to the uh, former uh, courts. So now we would say why we had that much problem uh, since billions of dollars were spent for the rule of law in uh, institution building in Afghanistan. What I found in my article the low attention were uh, given to the commercial course and for, for the economic support uh, in general. Uh, here is an example that I presented from 2015 US funding for Afghanistan rule of law reform that you can see the difference between uh, funding that was provided for criminal justice and the one that was uh, provided for economic support. And you can assume that this economic support was not only for the commercial courts. We ha I have identified some of the examples uh, in my article that how much of this money have been spent in other issues other than those procedural rules and, and uh, commercial dispute resolution. So the negative impact of uh, low function of commercial court as uh, OECD says, that the poor contract enforcement limits funding for the business expansion and tremendously slows down the rate of trade, investment, economic growth, and development in general that we had in Afghanistan. But uh, more specifically, uh, specifically, that discourage investment. Here we had a survey from 2014 that more than 40% of firms identify core system as a major constraint to their businesses in Afghanistan. And more spe specifically, that deters foreign direct investment in Afghanistan. And lastly, uh, a poor function of the court system may weaken institutions of the judiciary, the former institution of the judiciary. So the disputants may refer their cases to other alternatives, not only uh, alternative dispute resolution, which are more in practice uh, as a technical uh, uh, mechanism for uh, resolving disputes faster and with low cost, 
but to other form of alternatives, which is called uh, informal justice system in Afghanistan. So here in part two, um, I will discuss the problems and challenges to the enforcement of uh, commercial course uh, judgments. For, for the enforcement framework, you can see that the primary legal framework is uh, the law on procedure of obtaining rights uh, that was recently uh, promulgated in 2020 and uh, that replaced the old uh, law on procedure of obtaining rights from that was enforced from the first period of Taliban yeah, from 1990s, uh, 1990s. And then again, for some, some other aspect of uh, in enforcement of judges, the, the procedural guidance of the Ministry of Justice were used by hukuk departments in other laws like civil procedure code and commercial procedure code was taken in consideration. Um, in addition to that, as we mentioned before, Supreme Court's orders and guidance in, 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 in the framework of Mutahid uh, al or Musawaba were very common, uh, uh, commonly used by, by hukuk departments in the enforcement phase too. Um, um, as I mentioned before, Hukuk departments were established within the Ministry of Justice and they were functioned since 1920. And recently the de facto government in Afghanistan, the Taliban government decided to transfer that to the Supreme Court. And still to my knowledge, uh, as I uh, um, got information from colleagues back in Afghanistan, it's under process, the process not completed yet, but they decided to transfer these departments to the, um, uh, Supreme Court as, um, as a body attached to the courts in every provinces. But a main task of these departments were to enforce uh, the final judgments of civil and commercial courts in Afghanistan. The law on obtaining rights specifically identified an enforcement board that was headed by uh, Hukuk officers in each provinces and districts, but also had representatives from attorney general office, police, local government, municipality, and even experts and representatives from other entities if uh, required by the Hukuk officer. Uh, we were referred to that that was a big challenge to the enforcement of course, uh, course judgments itself. Uh, there was also, um, Another commission that prescribed by the law, the Commissioner for Complicated Loans, that was headed by the Minister of Justice with the representatives from the Supreme Court, uh, Attorney General Office, Ministry of Interior Affairs, um, National Director of Security, Administrative Office of the President, and uh, Bar Association of Afghanistan and Central Bank. When I took the responsibility of Hukuk General Department, this commission um, never took of a held a session. And that was only first time that we tried to hold a session. And at that time, no member had idea of the function of this commission. Uh, so the law provided an authority and responsibility to this commission, but the commission couldn't do anything to resolve some of those complicated and unenforced uh, court judgments. Uh, the law also prescribed a coordination committee that was also a high authority committee that was headed by the Minister of Justice with a representative from Supreme Court, um, Attorney General Office, Ministry of Interior Affairs, and NDS, Administrative Office of the President, and the, the head of uh, Board Association of Afghanistan. This was also for the second time that we held a session when I was responsible for the Hukuk General Department. So the, the normal enforcement process for commercial and civil judgments is that the judgment debtor will enforce voluntarily by himself within 15, 15 days of the issuance of the judgment. But if he default, then the Hukuk department will um, uh, force uh, execution or take force execution of the judgment of the court within 20 days. Uh, that time frame is very important to consider when we discuss some of the challenges later. So what they are doing in this phase is they are calling upon the enforcement board. They collect all those members of the enforcement board to, to, uh, to, to force execute uh, the judgment. And they, they, they start searching and identifying debtors assets, including their bank accounts through banks and other uh, uh, administration offices and entities. Uh, they they uh, take the permission of the court for selling the assets of uh, the debtor uh, through bidding in auction. 
and they can take uh, precautionary measurements, including preventing the sale and transfer of assets of the data and freezing their bank accounts and freezing their assets. And they can claim any dates of the data um, if the data have uh, from others. But uh, as we say, uh, if, if we go through all these phases in these uh, steps, these are not feasible within 20 days. That's why we had uh, challenges for the enforcement of course decision. Here the data, when I took the responsibility of the Cook Department, I started to collect the data about the unenforced and enforced judgments because we didn't have any report in any data on this for a long time. Um, uh, now you can see that the data is presented for the solar year and we started from 2014, 1393 solar year because that was the start of CMS that we said before. And we could compare the data from CMS uh, with the data that we collected from all uh, Hukuk departments all around the country from districts and uh, province level. So these are the data that we collected, but um, I want to reiterate that the, these data is not exclusive because uh, we identified that some of the data were not presented. So totally, uh, you can see that from 2014 to 2020, there were more than 1,400 uh, 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 commercial court judgments that was not enforced. So the de facto government assigned a group of judges in each provinces to consider uh, any, any uh, court decision from the previous government if it was not enforced. But that's, uh, again, will be challenging when we are seeing the challenges. The common reason that was given for the failure of the group departments for the enforcement of judgments were these. If you can see from the left-hand side, there are a list of reasons that most of them are subjective. Uh, absent of the creditor, creditor was not there to enforce and uh, to, to help the enforcement of the judgment. Now you will see, you, you will ask why if creditor is not there, what, what's the need for the enforcement of judgment? Because the law required the Hukuk department to enforce those judgments too. And there was lack of cooperation from the creditor in identifying and searching the debts, uh, the assets of the debt. And in some cases, the data was absent and even were abroad and there was no address of him and no identity documents of him or the data was uh, in present or he was disobeyed and uh, he was not um, uh, volunteer want to enforce the judgment. And lack of police cooperation, now you will ask why police cooperation, because there was a need of force enforcement and police uh, required to take um, security measurements for, for the enforcement board to, to, to take those steps. And they also complained about their job security and personal safety. They were threatened by uh, some of the, the disputants uh, for the enforcement of uh, uh, judgments. In, in, in the right hand, you can see that some of these uh, other reasons are very challenging. Lack of assets were identified as a main concern for the enforcement of uh, commercial uh, court judgments. So what, what they end up when um, a debtor was not able to pay, the Hukuk department, Hukuk officer had two choices. One, they could ask the court to divide uh, the debt to installment, but not more than one year. And now you can imagine um, how that will be feasible and possible to pay um, a very high value loan of more than 27 million within one year if there is no asset identified for the data. And the other very common option was to, to process or uh, um, to, to to implement criminal processes. And here the data may face criminal charges. Um, and this was what we identify very uh, challenging because I thought in, again, uh, when we refer to the left hand list of reasons, they are all subjective. And we were asking that in commercial cases, we are not uh, imposing or implementing judgment on the uh, personality or maybe the physical body of, of the data. We are implementing that on the assets of the data. Why we should uh, impose criminal charges on data in that case? 
But also we had uh, some cases that the data was uh, in prison, were sentenced several times, but still the court decision was unenforceable because there was no asset to pay and some debtors preferred to be in, 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 in prison instead of paying $30 million. Uh, so that was a big challenge. And also we have identified uh, that this was misuse including uh, by, by both Hukuk officers. They, they could refer some of the cases, they could deter uh, uh, the debtor uh, based on those uh, criminal charges and they, they could favor uh, the creditor on that on, on referring cases to the attorney general office. And sometimes uh, uh, attorney general office refuses to take those cases and sometimes they proceed with that with the court. So we, we, we have identified different uh, way of dealing with these type of cases and we, we identified that challenging in against rule of law. Um, and that's in the case that the constitution say that nobody will be put in prison uh, and will, uh, will, will lose his uh, freedom because of his indebtedness. So what was the alternative? The best alternative was the insolvency process. If uh, a debtor was not able to pay and there was uh, 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 no asset to pay for that, uh, then we could uh, start insolvency process. But uh, while we had uh, a specialized insolvency law there, uh, in specific procedure and uh, uh, our laws in civil code there, but uh, to my knowledge, court hasn't taken any, any cases for insolvency processes. So that was uh, a big challenge. And I haven't put it here. There was another big challenge that Afghanistan didn't have any, any uh, bilateral agreement with other countries, with neighboring countries that uh, most uh, merchants uh, have assets in those countries like uh, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, EUA, and maybe other countries. So uh, um, the only country that Afghanistan had a, bi a bilateral agreement with for the enforcement of foreign judgment that was India. But I have no knowledge of enforcing and taking the advantage of that bilateral, bilateral agreement for the enforcement of commercial code judgments. So beyond those reasons that were presented, we have also um, identified uh, here some, some other problems, including legal ambiguity, the problems within the legal framework. We have found uh, the, the main law law obtaining rights very challenging, least guiding uh, guidance were there for the uh, uh, officers to, uh, to enforce that. But also we have found uh, less cooperation from the courts. The, the court judgment itself was uh, in bake and not, not was the Hukuk, Hukuk officer were not able to enforce that. Here are some of the examples that I presented here. Court, court order sale of property, but that was occupied and court refused request for eviction process. Or court, uh, there was um, a standard security of a single land and uh, for, for several creditors and there was no guiding on the ranking of um, uh, creditors there. And when the case was referred to the court, the court didn't take any decision on that and didn't give any, uh, uh, any guidance to the Hukuk officers. And another uh, problem that we have identified that was within the enforcement board, they were not familiar with the, uh, with the procedure of the Hukuk, of, uh, Hukuk, uh, Hukuk in the law on obtaining rights. So they were not familiar. They, uh, there was also uh, a problem of timing the law required them, uh, each entity to, to uh, um, introduce their representative within two days, but in practice that lasts for more than two months to collect all those members of the enforcement board. And there was no budget allocated for their uh, process and procedure. We have also identified cooperation from other entities. For example, we had um, a case that, that the bank was uh, uh, ordered to uh, transfer the share of the data to the creditor but the bank refused and then we get to the central bank, the central bank didn't help at all. And we also had problem of communication. Uh, so the main way of communication of uh, formal documents was through postal services. And we have identified that for very minor issues, very, very minor deficiencies within the uh, cases, uh, file of cases, um, cases were rejected and referred to the postal services that took more than two or four months. 
and again, cases had to, to go through all the cycles from the primary court back to the Hukuk department and from Hukuk department back to the intermediate appellate court and then back to the Hukuk department and to the uh, final resort to the Supreme Court. We have uh, proposed to change that to only uh, send uh, final decisions to the Hukuk department and other cases should be directly uh, communicated between the uh, intermediate uh, and uh, first instance courts. We have also identified lack of personal and resources for the Hukuk departments. Uh, as we said, there's, uh, there was no budget allocation for them. And a very important issue, we have identified lack of professional monitoring supervision of the function of Hukuk uh, departments all over the country. There was no in-person supervision in monitoring. The, the monitoring was uh, vested to the audit unit of the Ministry of Justice, but they were not expert of Hukuk in commercial dispute processes. So uh, they, they end up with no decision. They couldn't identify some of those defects in problems within their function and services. Uh, there was uh, uh, no chance to take the advantage of CMS as I referred before, because uh, when I took uh, the responsibility of the Hukuk department within uh, six year, there was only 1,810 cases entered to the system among more than 16,000 all civil and commercial cases. And then we tried to, uh, to increase that. And as you see, the amount was doubled within three months of our supervision there. And we also changed the paper-based supervision. As we say, there was a long communication between the Hukuk General Department within its subordinating departments in provinces. So we took the advantage of those communication and we changed the administrative um, process of cases to professional process, process of cases. We could identify from monitoring those papers that we got from Hukuk departments. We could identify some of problems within their services and functions. And lastly, there was uh, no um, uh, way of reviewing complaints in a transparent way. We have uh, established an online complaints review committee that was successful for three months, and then suddenly the government collapsed. So within that, I will wrap up and we will look forward with the, uh, the changes there. There is no hope there, and as I um, get information from some of the colleagues, the uh, the, the situation is worse, and still uh, the cases all last longer there, and the workloads double. Before we had one thousand uh, for each course, and then uh, I think an official resource says that it was more than two thousand now by nine months of the last year. Um, uh, thank you so much. I will stop sharing and looking forward for your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to give, we have only three minutes left. Um, I felt bad. We had a, a cut Professor Omar's presentation a bit short. I was wanted to give uh, P Professor Omar, if you wanted to take maybe just a minute and wrap up your last thoughts in your presentation, if you, if you wish. That's all right. I could take questions. Uh, uh, maybe that way. Oh, sure. Can, There's yeah. somebody in the front um, right there um, that has a question, if you wish. Sounds like you had a really fascinating timeline of the choice of uh, constitutional adoption in Afghanistan. I'd never heard about um, you know, reaching out to the public to see what they wanted. They wanted a parliamentary system. It sounds like this was ignored. If, if you could kind of finish this, this, uh, the sequence of events for us with all the process traits, and it sounds like a lot of really fascinating uh, in-person interviews you did. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, the rest of that. Thanks. Um... Uh, yeah, so the, um, the, the the public consultation will, um, the results of that, I don't know if they will ever become available. Um, I'd love to see them. I've reached out to so many people to see if they have it. The person who actually told me, um, he even um, gave a percentage that about 70% of the population wanted a parliamentary system. Um, now, we do need to keep in 
mind that this process may not have been seamless and flawless. Um, they actually um, consulted, even consulted Afghan immigrants in Iran and in Pakistan. Um, but I, I would love to see those results, you know, someday. Um, so uh, yeah, that that will that will, that will remain a, a mystery for now. But it's interesting if they did actually want prefer parliamentary system, it did not make any difference in decision making, right? In um, to to choose the the presidential system. But yeah, so after the constitutional review commission. Um, the con the draft constitution goes to a national security council. Um, they uh, make uh, significant changes uh, to the constitution, and then um, it uh, it goes to um, it, it's debated in um, the uh, constitutional lawyer Jerga, where um, the um, uh, re representatives uh, participants and the jerga um, are not actually given a choice between presidentialism or parliamentary system. Um, uh, President Karzai, uh, in his opening speech, says uh, we're representing uh, the presidential system. You um, vote for it, uh, and at some point, the so the opposition actually. Uh, uh, raises a lot of concerns about this, uh, and at some point they're told um, if, if they do not like the presidential system, they can refrain from voting altogether. So it's a very um, sort of a power play, uh, the constitutional lawyer Jerga and the representatives to uh, the, 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 the UN representative then the, the US representative both actually are um, uh, in a smaller tent. So the constitutional lawyer takes place in a large tent um, with over 1500 participants. And then um, they are divided into um, smaller um, committees where they discuss um, various articles. And then there's a smaller tent where uh, Lakhtar Brahimi and Khalid Zad are um, uh, sitting and, and um, according to one observer, um, they're um, sort of twisting arms. Um, so, uh, so it it in uh, in at the end, um, there is a lot of discontent um, uh, among the opposition. Um, there were certain promises that were made um, during the constitutional Jaga um, negotiations that were then undone when the formal um, text of the constitution came out. There are at least four um, um, complaints um, made and um, one, um, uh, Thomas Riddick, who was, um, I believe at the time, um, writing for a um, a European um, media news media um, uh, observed, observed he actually compared a copy of the draft constitution to the published official copy, and he confirmed three out of the the four complaints. Um, so um, again, it was a very um, sort of. Uh, um, interest uh, based process where those who had more power were able to actually pursue their preferences more successfully than those who were not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. This is such a fascinating panel that as you can see, this, this is obviously a very complex topic. Both of these uh, presentations are discussing the complexities of creating a framework in Afghanistan. So unfortunately we're out of time. Um, I encourage anybody who had um, other questions as well to reach out directly to the panelists. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for attending this panel. Thank you so much for your interest and thank you so much for the presenters today. Um, we look forward to um, seeing you at other panels. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.